counselor with us at Children's Hospital, um, and we thought her perspective would be really valuable in today's discussion, so she'll be joining us as well. So as a reminder, we have two microphones, one on either side, um, and if you would please come up to the microphone to ask your question. If you need us to bring you a mic, please just wait for about 30 seconds until the magic mic person gets to you so that we can all hear your, hear your questions. Holly. Really amazing presentations. Is this on? Hey there. Um, those were all really amazing, thought provoking, and moving presentations. Um, I was really interested to hear from each of you, um, and Lainey and Ken talked a little bit about this about direct to consumer testing and adolescents in particular. And I was really interested in the Fisher's discussion about um, that space that you are in and who's in that space with you. And I was wondering if each of you could comment on what you think the implications are for testing in adolescents um, and potentially children of direct-to-consumer testing. Who wants to start with that? Lainey, you want to start on this end and work, work over? I think it's medically irresponsible. Um, it's fascinating to me. So in one side, if a family wants this information, I want them to be able to have it, but I want them to be able to have it in the proper context. I want them to be able to have counselors. I want them to be able to know where to go in the next steps and things of that sort. So I think we missed the boat in a lot of direct-to-consumer advertising and medications in that regard. I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, we're seeing it crop up in all sorts of ways, and I think this is only the beginning of more that we'll see. Um, there are many different ways for people to access this information. Um, you know, we think about doing it in the context, the traditional context that it's usually delivered uh, through a healthcare provider. Um, that model is rapidly changing. It has implications for the ways in which we talk to families, um, educate families, teach people how this information may or may not be useful for them, and so forth. Um, for people who are very motivated to seek this information, it's absolutely out there. And for parents who would like to acquire this information for their children, who may approach a pediatrician or so forth and be told this isn't generally something we recommend, there are ways for them to still be able to seek this outside of the healthcare context. And for all the reasons that we're talking about it, it's, it's very concerning to me. Um, and I don't know what the solution is. Um, clearly, I think we do need to work with the testing companies potentially to try to help them provide some better support um, for families. Um, that potentially is our responsibility, but the responsibility clearly rests with them to recognize the need for that. But I think we as providers also need to be working a little bit more closely with families to really understand what their motivations are, what their needs are, um, and how we can help accomplish that with them in the context of their health care, because I, I truly believe that is a more appropriate home for it. Um, I, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in the HHS discussion on direct-to-consumer on July 7th. And it was really, really interesting because Navigenics was there, 23andMe, and um, DNA Direct, and, and nothing, nothing was resolved that day. The only thing that was even sort of remotely resolved was that these um, CEOs were actually going to have a conversation about the uh, policy support and information support that they were going to offer to consumers because what it looks like is um, they want to sell a product that we are desperate to buy, but they don't understand how dangerous that information can be to us. So um, I guess I'm, I'm with you, Ken. I, I think there's no right answer right now, but again, um, major, major caveats. I think it's a very slippery slope. I'll just piggyback on what my mom said and just point out the fact that the information for me um, was not particularly jarring, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my talk, but I think that it was partly because it was in a very uh, defined clinical setting, um, and it was kind of the information that you'd expect to hear. I was with a genetic counselor. It was um, handled in the appropriate way, and I can't picture having received that information uh, in an envelope in the mail and opening it myself. So. 
So I have two points to make. So from the provider's perspective, I think that when we get requests to see families um, and the situation arises, we get the knee-jerk reaction of, well, we're not supposed to do this testing practice guidelines say against that. But the fact that direct-to-consumer testing exists, if I say no, I know they can go and get it someplace else. So I think it's our responsibility to do more research and have more guidance on how practitioners can have that conversation with families. Because I feel like if they're going to do it, I'd rather have them do it with me having an extensive conversation about the pros and cons of testing. Um, and secondly, as far as direct-to-consumer testing goes, I think that there are many com companies coming about who have genetics providers involved in their staff and who are working hard at these issues, so involving genetic counselors and other genetics providers that are trying to address these issues. I don't think it's going to be a challenge for them. I think it's hard to replace that in-person interaction, but um, it's a reality. So um, we have to do our best to, to aid them as well. Thank you, Henry. Go to Dr. Baca. Sort of two questions that uh, they're uh, related. And the first one, uh, and I would say, I guess my thinking about the issues that have been part of the discussion this morning have been pretty heavily influenced by the fact that a lot of people really don't want this information. And I'm not sure those statistics are changing, even though the literature is pretty clearly showing that uh, prophylactic measures are effective with BRCA1 and certainly with. Uh, colon cancer susceptibility genes, but yet still 50% or so of folks who are well counseled about this decide not to pursue testing. So I'd be interested in Rebecca's and Catherine's perspective in particular on how it is that we understand that. It sounds like for your family, the information was very much wanted and very valuable uh, and beneficial, but do we understand why other folks aren't pursuing testing in this sort of uh, circumstance? And then a corollary perhaps primarily for Laney, is to say that, you know, my understanding is that a lot of adolescents are pretty ambivalent about this sort of situation. And I'm concerned about the situation in which parents may want adolescents tested, not primarily for the benefit of the adolescent, but for their own peace of mind, uh, dealing with their own concerns and guilt, uh, et cetera. And I wonder whether you would be open to a change in what I, I believe your position is here, which is to say, why not require the adolescent to have a, a positive commitment and interest in testing along with the parent and sort of preclude the possibility that a parent might want a six-year-old or ten-year-old uh, tested for an adult onset condition like BRCA1? Uh, so I'll go ahead and answer the first question. Um, in terms of family members who do not want results, um, we actually en encountered that problem quite, um, quite widely in my family. My mother became kind of a, um, you know, a campaign, a campaigner for knowing about BRCA1, and there were many people who kind of closed the door on her, and I think she was quite hurt. Um, we ended up having to respect that overall, and it was, it was hard because we thought, well, who wouldn't want to know? Um, but some people don't, we had to respect that. However, that brings up a very interesting potential doctoral dissertation for anyone who's considering it. So if you look at the work of um, Talcott Parsons in the 50s where he actually made a model out of what we do with sick people, you know, we exempt them from uh, work and um, we let them stay home and watch Oprah and, you know, we don't, we don't bother them very much. Okay. Here's the question. What if they know that they're going to get sick? What happens to that exemption? Do they get a pass still? And the interesting thing for our family is, uh, no, they don't. And there was a lot of residual anger when my 46-year-old cousin died of ovarian cancer, having delayed any kind of testing or any kind of surveillance until she already was stage three. And she left behind a six-year-old, and I mean to tell you, we were rabidly angry with her. So the same thing did not hold true. Um, there are consequences relationally, not just physically. And um, it, it really caused a huge problem in our family. So Jeff, I don't, I'm not sure that we actually disagree. Um, in, in the ideal clinical, genetic counseling setting, I would hope that we could convince most parents of their six-year-old that they do want to wait until their child is an adolescent and can be part of the conversation. 
Uh, my concern is the parent who then looks at me and says, if I wait till she's 14 and she says no, you're not going to let me do it. And so that parent might want to do it at six or eight. Now again, this is all about different parenting styles. I have a 10 and 11 year old at home, so I'm not one to be able to say I did it right. I'm not sure at what point I will be able to say I did or didn't do it right, but clearly not at 10 and 11. Um, and, and I say that because I, while I would want the parent to wait, there are parents who are going to want to test and not to allow their child to be part of that decision-making process. And I'm just not convinced that it's wrong for all families. And so therefore, again, when I can't figure out that there's no objective scale for benefit or burden, I'm just going to leave it to the parents. So the presumption should be that we do wait until adulthood, but that if the family really wants it and the adolescent is on board in the teenage years, we're going to respect that. And if the parents really want it in the younger years, we're going to have to respect it because we just can't determine what's best for each family a priori. Yes, over here. I, I have a couple of things. One is uh, thank you, Lainey, for saying things that I have been arguing <laughs> for 20 years. Uh, I'm a clinical geneticist, so my arguments tend to be more within my department. But um, um, the, the, the idea that uh, allowing parents to make decisions that are in the best interest of their children that in terms of the family structure um, is very important. And I, I can tell you that on a very practical level, I spend a lot of time counseling parents who want their children tested. And if you sit down and go through pros and cons, um, the vast majority of parents will actually decide to defer testing um, and will be very comfortable with their decision um, because they've got a plan and they understand and, and really their best, in, they really have the, their children's best interest at heart. Having said that, my question is actually for Rebecca and, and Katie, and thank you very much for, for sharing your personal experiences with us. Um, Katie, would you have liked to have this test when you were nine or 10? And Rebecca, would you have considered if, if, you know, if the doctor had said, you know, sort of once you've recovered some of your own health, this is something you can test your, your kids for. And can I ask if your brothers have had testing? That's two separate questions. Um, neither of my brothers have been tested. Um, I don't know if that's in the, in the works in the future. But um, I don't know that there was a certain age. I think looking back at it, nine is pretty young um, to know that. But it's also pretty young to have happened to you what happened to us. So I don't, to, for me, 18 was sort of an arbitrary year that's kind of legally determined. Um, it, I was no more ready for it then than I would have been now than I would have been at nine. It's just, it's a fact of life for us, and you know, the biggest point for me is that knowing does not change the trajectory that my body is going on. So it, I wouldn't not get cancer at 30 hypothetically, knowing or not knowing that information. So I think that. Um, to Dr. Ross's point earlier, the ambiguity was much more difficult to deal with for me than just actually knowing um, and being able to take steps and have my insurance pay for those steps um, because that was really, it doesn't put your mind at ease, but it definitely helps to know what you're facing, I think. And I think your question for me was, would, uh, would we have considered that young age testing? Right. Had it been available? Um, I mean, had it, had it been offered, or would you even have thought at, you know, or when, as your kids were growing up, when they were 11, 12, 13, did you think, gee, I, it'd be nice if we could get them tested now, especially for Katie? No, no and, I and wouldn't have. No, I wouldn't have. And I don't know how my husband, he's not, he's shaking his head no to, you know, I, I, no, <laughs> there would have been no reason, but the, that said, um, we did not hide the information from her either. So when she was 9, 10, 11, she would hear me trying to walk my mom off the ledge after you know she tried to <laughs> campaign the thing around the world. Um, she would hear those conversations, and we didn't keep them away from her for the exact reason that we wanted her to know this was a reality for her. Dr. Teresiak, did you want to follow up on that um, in terms of what you've observed with your patient population? Um, you know, families 
whole families are very complex dynamic systems and it's it you know what may be right for one person is clearly not going to be right for others and when we put this information in the hands of parents and, and do which is what's been discussed and talk with them about the pros of doing this but but also the risks of doing that that's a very important conversation to have it's a very needed conversation and also to let them know how other families may have also worked through this and may have resolved this to know that they're again not the only person who's had to confront this um, again there isn't a whole lot of opportunity to sort of normalize this experience in the way that there is for example for women who may be going treatment through treatment for breast cancer where there's more of a sense of community, social awareness, a lot of recognition. This is still something which, as much as it's on our radar screen, for the general public, it's it's less so. We certainly are learning more about it, um, so. Thanks. Dr. Stapleton. Yes, we, we've talked about the, the issues from, within cultures that we think we understand, the majority cultures. We're in a global society and multiple cultures in our, in our own country with immigrants who different generations have different values. So I wonder if, there's any, if there are any information about how uh, different cultures handle these discussions. And secondly, if you're working with non-English speaking families, what is the ability of the interpreter to influence uh, the discussion and, and how that's handled? Dr. Tushik, you want to start with that? Have you, have you looked at the cross-cultural issues? Or? Sure. Um, given, at least in the context of BRCA 1 and 2, and, and perhaps for many of the other adult onset predictive um, uh, conditions, um, there's very little research in that area. It's, it's certainly needed. Even within our own country, we need to understand more about how uh, people of color, uh, people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds may come to either want or not want this information, appreciate this information, and so forth. That is largely unanswered, I think. Um, and then to extend that to how um, individuals in other cultures, potentially um, outside the US. There's obviously a lot of work which is done on this um, in the UK. Um, but I think the kinds of issues you're asking are about really where the, the cultural norms could be very different, social norms very different around genetic information um, and what it may need, what it may mean for those folks. That's an area certainly where more work is needed in my mind. I totally agree with everything that Kendra said. I want to add one thing, which is for many communities, there's a real access problem. Having access to getting BRCA1 and 2 testing requires insurance requires insurance of a certain type. And I think that that will actually hamper any attempts to really get a, the real diversity of, of positions that we really need to know. Um, if you, when you just look at your data, as you mentioned, it was non-representative. It was a very heavily Caucasian community with a high degree of education. And I think we have to acknowledge that, that we have a very biased sample in part because of access to genetic testing. So it's just my plug for November. <laughs> it's her third plug for November. <laughs> Jesse, did you did you want to speak to the question of using a translator and sure. Yeah. So I think that using a translator in any genetics interaction is pretty challenging, um, particularly in testing um, discussions like for BRCA1 and 2, where we're really talking about the pros and cons and leaving it up to the person I'm sitting with to decide whether or not that's an option they want to pursue. Culturally, if where they call home, the doctor says, you have a test or you don't, my experience is they often would look at me and say, well, what do you think I should do? What should I do? The, the discussion of it being a choice for them to have the test was very challenging and made more challenging by having an interpreter and losing that um, subtle interaction that you get when you can really um, interact in the same language. So I think it's very challenging when you're working with people from other cultures. I'm interested in the panel's opinion and any providers in the audience as well um, about the role of the laboratory in revealing carrier status when it wasn't requested. So this would be a situation where you're doing prenatal diagnosis or um, diagnostic testing for the purpose of medical management and no mutations in a family. Does the laboratory have the right or does the laboratory have the obligation to restrict that information and only answer the question that was asked? Wants to feel that. 
It's a great question. I would actually say that part of it is, should be part of the consent process. Um, so if I agreed that this was the only information I was going to get, it's one thing. If I said, well, any information that's obtained, I want that information, then the lab, I guess, has the option to say we refuse to do the test because we only want to give positives and not necessarily carriers. Um, and so I think that has to be a negotiation up front so that everyone's in agreement. This is particularly important in the research setting where sometimes there'll be research studies which will say we're not going to give any information back. And, and potential re, uh, research participants may say, well, I don't want that. They still have an option. Their option is not to participate. And I think we have to sometimes you know, talk with our feet and say, if that's the way you want to play the game, I'm not willing to play. And I think for the most part, when testing is ordered um, by genetics providers who are typically more well-versed in the potential results, um, that conversation happens. Um, but recognize a lot of testing is ordered by um, providers who wouldn't think that that might be an option or wouldn't think to talk to the family about it. So the consenting process prior to the testing um, it doesn't necessarily happen. And also, when you introduce um, a consent process for every diagnostic test, it also be, it creates its own issues, I guess, about um, whether you're really getting informed consent. Is that really necessary? We don't consent them to have, you know, any other blood tests they might have, like an, or a CT scan, or you know, a CBC. Those those diagnostic tests are not consented either, so it kind of raises a bunch of different options and issues. So it gets, uh, so they are all consented to. I would disagree because if I don't consent, I don't stick my arm out. I don't agree to put the tourniquet around my arm. I don't allow the needle to touch my skin. So it's not a formal consent when you're trying to get a CBC from a patient, but clearly there's a degree of consent. And, and Dr. Alexander and I were talking about this during the break. For things like a CBC where we both know we're doing it to look for anemia or for look for a white cell infection or something of that sort, where both the doctor and the patient are looking to, for a very specific thing to help the patient get better, the consent doesn't have to be as long as you would want for a research protocol that's had IRB approval. We're doing this for a medical diagnosis, we have a concern, we have a reason for it, we're getting this lab test. Once we get into genetic testing, predictive testing, um, for a dis disease that um, you may never actually get, and that would be wonderful, right? I mean, the gene isn't necessarily diagnostic that, that someone will develop cancer. I think the consent has to be much richer, much longer, and we need to understand all the details. So I don't like the idea, I mean, it gets back to this whole issue of mandatory newborn screening. Anytime we touch somebody, we need to get their consent. And when the child can't speak for themselves, it should be the parent. But so for all tests, there should be a consent. And if the physicians who are ordering it are ignorant of what they're ordering, this is speaking about the physician education that needs to go on, as well as the fact that there's patient education that needs to go on. I also just want to make one last plug, which is there's a lot about carrier status that we don't understand. We look at Fragile X, we used to think about Fragile X syndrome. We now know that premutations have lots of different adult onset disorders, whether it's premature ovarian uh, failure or whether it's uh, Fragile X ataxia syndrome, um, whether there's some cognitive disabilities that may come from having an increased number of mutations. So I think that to suggest, well, the carrier information has no implications, as far as we understand at this time, but our understanding of genetics is evolving quite quickly, so I'm not convinced that people should make those decisions without having a real conversation, which includes the provider, the lab, and the families. Rebecca and Katie, I was wondering if you might want to say a little bit more about your experience with the informed consent process, either of you, um, at the time of testing or beforehand. Um, I think it was pretty straightforward with Katie. Um, there weren't a lot of issues with it, but in terms of our family with the informed consent, um, an interesting thing happened in our family because we were, I was sick um, before BRCA1 was discovered, so um, our family was involved in linkage analysis before that. Um, after BRCA1 was discovered, we enrolled with um, the University of Michigan, Barbara Weber's group, um, and we went for a period of about five years waiting for results. Now, I am certain that the informed consent said we may or may not provide any results, but 
our family conveniently overlooked that and um, really demanded those results. When they weren't forthcoming, they weren't available. My two sisters, I have two sisters, and one older, one younger, they both had prophylactic mastectomy because they simply could wait no longer for the results. Turned out they didn't have the gene mutation. It was devastating for them, absolutely devastating. But um, one of the things I, I just want to add, and this is interesting and an aside, the reason that we didn't get results out of, out of that study was that the, um, and this kind of speaks to the laboratory issue in a way, the reason uh, we didn't get results is that um, in the research setting they were testing mRNA, they were not testing genomic DNA. So when we ultimately went to Myriad and paid for the test, um, they tested genomic DNA. And our mutation was on an intron. So that's really weird. And it just speaks to that whole confusion, that kind of zone of confusion. And informed consent can get you someplace, but it can't get you every place. I am a physician that does a lot of work with child maltreatment. And first of all, I just want to say this was really a wonderful session. I really want to thank the Fishers. I think you added something so unique and really helped us. But I wanted to follow up on Ms. Fisher, your comment, and I don't even know exactly how to say it. Do you think there's any difference in the ethics of learning your information when you're a parent? <laughs> that is, when there are other people depending on you, depending on your health, and perhaps, of course, I know it's the obvious question of your own children needing testing or not needing testing, but just being a parent, does that change anything in terms of sort of that? the goodness, rightness, or responsibility well, of the parent? Since you seem to be asking me, although I am waiting for this grandchild, um, I, I will say that, um, that, yes, being a parent added a layer of responsibility that um, I could not look away from. Absolutely not. No way. So, even if, and that's really the reason that Ben, you know, called me a year ago to do this, because I've been talking it up, like, all over the place. And, and if we could just inform a few people that these steps that they take could actually help them, um, that's what we're out to do. So there is a responsibility there, and I think an acceptance of that. Just add to that, I we work with with parents, they always have a very special set of roles that they're playing completely outside of this healthcare context. And in many different research contexts, not just BRCA1 and 2, we consistently see over and over again that it is um, uh, individuals who have children who are more likely potentially to step forward to want this information um, because they know there may be somebody else at home who's potentially at risk. Um, and really the, the very strong instinct, if you will, um, for parents to want to protect their children and to see this as one possible additional element um, that they may need to know about to ward against. It's, it, it's a very strong finding. The question for Lainey, um, regarding the last section of your talk with the adolescents, and it's really a, an issue of just clarification because you presented so much information, sometimes I was not tracking all of it this correctly, I think. It was clear to me that you were suggesting that if both the adolescent and the parent were interested in genetic testing for an adult condition, you would certainly take that very seriously and probably would might go with their view. And, and, Vice versa, if they were not interested, you would respect that also. Where I was getting, where I was unclear was on the issue of disagreement. In other words, I understood your comment about being concerned about the implications of disagreement for what parents might decide earlier on. But for that 16-year-old in front of you where there was disagreement on one side or the other, I'm, I wanted to see how I understand how you, what your view is and how you see that being different from what the, the standard view would be. So if a 16-year-old wants testing and the parent doesn't want testing, um, it may also be the case that the parent actually hasn't had his or her own testing, right? I mean, it's possible that we're talking about a late enough onset disease that my daughter is 16 years old, I'm 40 years old, and I may not come down with any symptoms until I'm 45 or 15 have chosen not to test. Um, and so I actually think that parents have a right of privacy against their children. 
So the, my answer to that 16-year-old is, in two years, you're an adult. Come back and don't bring your mom. And we'll do the test. <laughs> On the flip side, I have a mom and I have a 16-year-old who's saying no, and I really view this like an elective procedure, and I'm also not going to do the test. And that's why I acknowledge that I think some parents, not that I agree with them, but some parents are then going to want this test at age six because their answer is going to be, I can't be assured that we're not going to be in our rebellious period. We're going to have some conflict parent-child and that my child's going to allow me to get this testing at this point. So in order to protect her as a young adult when she may not be seeking medical care, I want this test when she's six and I don't want to wait till 14. And I think it would be irresponsible for the provider not to try to work with this family and convince them that it really is best, all things considered, to wait until she's an adult or at least until she's an adolescent. Um, but that's so the parent needs to realize that as the child gets older, the child's descent is going to be binding. Does anyone else want to add to that? We'll go over here. I want to thank the participants because I think it's been a really fantastic panel and, and very thought provoking. As a genetics provider, um, I wanted to raise a couple of issues that sometimes uh, make the cloud the issues that we deal with in terms of doing testing, particularly for individuals who may be at risk to be either carriers or for a excellent condition or actually have a condition like BRCA. And one of those was actually raised, I think, by Katie in saying that at age 18 you had insurance coverage and could actually pay for the testing. I think it's important to remember how expensive genetic testing can be, and many young adults do not have insurance coverage to be able to pay for their testing. And so I think that it, it is important, and maybe you all have some comments about timing related to insurance coverage, which unfortunately is a reality that we all face in this country. And a second comment is um, one that when genetic test results come back and are very clearly um, indicating that there is a known mutation or mutation that we think will predispose to disease development, the genetic counseling issues are relatively clear. But in the case particularly of conditions such as breast cancer testing, we oftentimes end up with results of unclear significance. And wondering if anyone wanted to uh, tackle that very challenging issue that we face in the genetic counseling realm. So first, the question of insurance. Um, you wouldn't want to take You that. don't want another non-paid political endorsement, I'm do you? I'm happy to have <laughs> I think we agree on our endorsement, so go for it. I mean, I, I, I raise that issue in the context of one of the reasons we don't have the diversity of information about various cultures, racial and ethnic groups, and socioeconomic status is not just the paying for the test, but um, and then also all the concerns of even paying for the follow-up testing if one is found to be positive. The, um, does anybody else want to take the second question? I'll, I'll let you start. Um, the issue of, of uninformative test results in general, I mean, it's from, from, I guess, from the professional standpoint, I mean, there's, there's a lot of open questions. It's certainly a gray area of how do, you, how do you guide, how do you counsel around that, how do you convey this news that it's, it's certainly on this spectrum of, of, of black to white, but you're, you're, you're just about in the middle of that. I think from the, from the participant's perspective, the patient's perspective, it's very difficult to know what they really hear. Um, I think many times, um, you know, families obviously are searching for something and the likelihood, unfortunately, they may convert that to the, you know, the good news that I'm not at risk when, when we know that we, we, we can't say that. Um, but it gets to the issue of it's, it's very difficult for, for, for all of us to sort of wrestle with these issues of probability and numbers and, and what this risk means and I would I would just put in a, a plug for the for the counselors in the audience. We need more research coming from within your field to really pair with work that's being done in other areas um, about numeracy and what is the best way to communicate risk information. It's absolutely critical because there's much that we don't yet know about the sort of lived experience of uninformative individuals as they sort of move on with their lives. But to take them back to the moment of when they first learned that news, we probably need to do a better and more thorough job of accurately conveying that because I think the likelihood that they will misperceive or misremember over time is, is, is high and it's alarming to me. Jesse, would you mind maybe adding a, a little bit about your experience and how you handle ambiguity? 
uh, in your role as a counselor? Sure. Well, we have new testing technology that became available where we're running into this situation quite a lot. Um, and I think that from our perspective, the best thing that we can do is to counsel families before the testing is done that this is a possible result. And in that discussion with families where they think they're going to come in and get a yes or no answer, that there may be an answer that in the end we won't know. And it may take many years to know and we may never know. And just as families, when they get an um, ambiguous result, would say, oh, good, I'm off the hook, I think many get the ambiguous result and just assume that it's the worst as well. So. Um, I think you're right, more research needs to be done so that we can better deal with these issues that are definitely coming up more and more as technology is expanding. Sometimes it's also not just the ambiguity of the results. So for example, with CF testing for, for carrier, um, we, we test for 86 mutations, there are over 1,300 mutations. Um, we could test for all 1,300, it would be very, very expensive. And so. Sometimes it's also when we tell a family that it's negative, it's actually only negative within the grounds of what we tested for. So there are two different types of ambiguity. One is the ambiguity of with Fragile X, you have 45 to 55 mutations and less than 45 is negative and 55 is a premutation and we have this grounds that we're really not sure of. But in other cases, it's if you go to Myriad and you get the whole gene sequence, we may find both um, that you are specifically carrying a mutation that's never been seen before, or that you're actually carrying a SNP that's different, but it may not even be necessarily disease. And we see this with the newborn screening and the MSMS and, and Dr. Foss's example of MBAD and what does it mean. So I actually am always impressed how well, all things considered, families embrace this ambiguity. I think they do a lot better than many of the healthcare providers. We don't like saying we don't know. Um, and that's really hard. And so I think it's not just about doing research, but it's also training us to get comfortable with the fact that we're giving out ambiguous information. We have time for one more question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very moving. Uh, my question is maybe beyond the scope of this panel, but I'll ask it anyhow. Since you're all involved with BRCA1, is any research going to a potential blocking the hazardous effect of this mutation on the cellular level to prevent causing different cancers? I'm not sure I fully understand. Okay. Is any research going to blocking the hazardous effect of having BRC1 so it won't cause? breast cancer or, or pancreatic cancer or? You mean like a chemo, chemo, chemo preventive, like something to keep it from happening? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware. But I would like to bring up another Please. aspect of that Please. particular problem, uh, which is something that came up at the direct-to-consumer HHS meeting on the 7th. And it had to do with those embryos in the UK that were looked at for BRCA1 positivity or not. And one that was selected for implantation was not carrying BRCA1. And I thought, wow, when I heard about it, I thought it was wonderful. And then I realized what happened to the other embryos. And it was very disturbing to me. So at the meeting on July 7th, and I'm just throwing this out there, I know it's Probably not a good time to bring it up, but um, at the meeting um, in the Reagan International Center on the 7th, there was a gentleman from the University of Washington present, a lawyer, and he was a small person. Um, he waited very patiently for his moment to speak about this, and when he did open his mouth, you could have heard a pin drop because what he said was not religious, it was not ethical, it was none of those things that you would expect. He said, what did that say to people like me? And I thought that was profound and excellent. And I would just like to bring that up as a topic that probably should be explored. Well, thank you. We can explore that topic over lunch. Um, it's time to get everyone, everyone fed. Please join me in thanking the panel.